I trust, as I said earlier, I trust that you had a wonderful New Year's uh, with uh, family and friends. So, so here's a question this morning. How many of you have already broken your New Year's resolutions for the year? All right. Any brave souls? All right. How many of you said, I'm not even making a New Year's resolution this year because I break it every year? All right. That's the, that's the majority of us. It seems like, for some reason, somebody, uh, I saw a cartoon this morning, I don't know if it was on, on MSN or where I saw a cartoon that, that somebody looks to somebody else and says, what is a New Year's resolution? And the other person in the cartoon says, well, that's generally people's goals for the first week of the year. And I guess that's what New Year's, genero- uh, New Year's resolutions generally are. Well, I mean, most of us, make these resolutions, we're going to lose weight, we're going to go on a diet, we're going to go to the gym, uh, we're going to watch less TV, we're going to read more books, we're going to exercise, we make those resolutions and uh, we tend to not keep them very long. What worries me more is that often we make spiritual resolutions. And as a new year begins, we make a commitment, a promise to God God, this year I'm going to do this. This year I'm going to be in church on Sunday mornings. Or this year I'm going to read my Bible every day. This year I'm going to pray more. God, this year I'm not going to look at pornography. God, this year I'm not going to be dishonest. I'm going to be honest in in everything that I do. This year I'm not going to lose my temper. And we make those resolutions, but if we're not careful, those resolutions seem to pass just as quickly as our secular resolutions. Quite frankly, one of the reasons why we don't fulfill those spiritual commitments that we make to God is because we're weak. Now, now you might not like hearing that, but it's true. One of the reasons that we don't fulfill those spiritual resolutions is that we're weak. And one of the main reasons that we succumb to our weaknesses is that you and I cannot resist temptation. Temptation is too strong. It has too much of a pull on our lives. We we just cannot seem to overcome it. It was Oscar Wilde who made that now famous quote that said, I can resist anything except temptation. (laughs) And many of us are that way. And when something seems to tempt us, seems to get the best of us, we just cannot resist it. You might sit back today and say, okay, Brian, what is temptation? In your notes, in your outline, I've given you a a, a definition of temptation. I've defined it this way. Temptation is when a person thinks thoughts, considers actions, or desires things that are contrary to the thoughts, intents, and desires of God. And so some temptation for you and me is not only when we do something, when we succumb to something, but but temptation is that when we are drawn, when we're pulled to, to think something, to do something, to act in a certain way, to, to give in to desires that are contrary to what God wants for our lives. In your notes, I made three introductory comments about temptation that are, that are really powerful. I want you to see them before we dive into our passage today. The first is this. Temptation is universal. It's universal. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Every single one of us is tempted. There's not a single person here today that can say, uh-uh, not me. I overcame that temptation thing a long time ago. No, you didn't. And neither did I. See, it doesn't matter your level of spirituality. It doesn't matter how long you've been a believer. All of us are tempted. Temptation is universal. Now, we maybe don't recognize it anymore. Maybe it's become so commonplace in our lives that it doesn't bother us, but all of us are tempted. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the temptations in your life are no different than what others experience. Look at the person beside you. That person is tempted. Look at the person on the other side of you. That person is tempted. Why? Because temptation is universal. 
we're all tempted. The second thing I would say is this. Temptation is personal. It's personal. James chapter 1 and verse 14 says this. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. See, here's the idea. Our enemy, the the devil, is unbelievably astute. And he knows you and he knows me. And so he does this. He personalizes our temptations. Quite honestly, the things that tempt me might not tempt you at all. And the things that tempt you might not tempt me at all. There's an interesting verse, if we can put that verse back up, James 1.14, where it says, temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. The, the word entice is a very interesting word in the New Testament. It has the idea, it paints a picture of bait being dangled in front of a fish. Any fishermen here this morning? And so you know what it's like. I mean, you put, this morning I have some worms I have some gummy worms on a fishing pole today and so uh, the word entice has the idea that that Satan takes takes that and and drops it right in front of us and it becomes it becomes tempting to us go ahead Glenn take that take that Julio take that Come on, take it. And over and over again, he, he personalizes, he, put what's, he puts what's tempting to us in front of us. And, and he dangles that in front of us over and over again. You might sit back and say, boy, Brian, you know what, that, that doesn't entice me at all. Boy, you know what, that, that gummy bear just doesn't, doesn't do anything for me. Well, you know what? If it doesn't do anything for you, he changes the bait. And, and maybe for you, he puts a $50 bill out there. It's like, it's like, yeah, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, everybody gives in to temptation, all right? And, and, and he puts it out there and says, hey, you know what? If, if the gummy bear doesn't do it for you, maybe this will do it for you. What, what can I do to make you fall? And here's the idea. He knows your weaknesses, and he knows my weaknesses. And if the, I think I said gummy bear. It's not a gummy bear. It's a gummy worm, right? If the worm doesn't work, he puts money out there. If money doesn't work, he puts something else out there. And he is constantly dangling it in front of you. But you know, as I, as I thought about that temptation, I thought that, that really doesn't even describe it because especially here in South Florida, I'm going to leave this here. Matt, you are the guard of this today, all right? Whenever we bow our head and close our eyes, make sure nobody comes up and gets that, all right? Um, um, it, here in South Florida, especially, we are bombarded by temptation. It seems like everywhere we go, we're tempted. Does anybody else feel that way? I mean, everywhere we go, we're tempted. And so to me, that doesn't even describe it perfectly. This is the best way that I describe it. This is the way that we're tempted right here. All right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where we turn. It doesn't matter which direction we turn. We're being tempted by something. Do you feel that way? I do. And, 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 and I know we're having fun today, and we're joking about it, but church, listen, temptation is real. It, it's a battle that every single one of us face. In the uh, passage we're looking at today, and we're going to read it in just a few moments, we go through and we see that. But notice temptation is personal. The devil is going to personalize temptation to fit what your weakness is. Let me mention the third thing. Temptation is not only universal, it's not only personal, but temptation is dangerous. There in James chapter 1 and verse 15, James said this, these desires give birth to sinful actions. 
You might sit back and say, man, man Brian, it's just, it's just a simple little desire. It's something I crave. And most of the time, I, I don't give in to it. I'm able to control it most of the time. It's not that big a deal. It is that big a deal. It's dangerous in your life and in mine. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So, so, so while we're being bombarded by temptations, and it seems like everywhere we go, we're being bombarded by temptations, how can you and I be victorious? That's a great question to ask as we begin this new year, because quite honestly, if all of us were honest today and we would put our weaknesses up on the screen. You have a weakness that's defeated you over and over and over again. You are struggling with something that you just cannot get the victory over. For some of you, it's pornography. Every time you look at it, you get this sense of conviction and you, and you turn your computer off and you, and you promise that you're never going to do that again. But a few days later, you are drawn to it. Maybe it's, maybe it's watching something on the television that you shouldn't watch. Maybe it's improper use of, of your money. And even though you know that, that your addictive spending harms your family, you do it over and over and over again. Maybe it's a substance that you just have not been able to get the victory over. And you sit back and say, Brian, it's not that big a deal. It is that big a deal. Because you have an enemy who is using that temptation. And his one goal in your life is to defeat you and to destroy you. And he will do everything he can to do that. So how can we experience victory over temptation? Is there anyone who has done it before that's kind of paved the way for us, that, that can show us how that we can be victorious, someone that can be our example? Well, the good news is there is someone. His name is Jesus. And he was tempted just like you. And he was tempted just like me. Only one big difference, without sin. He never sinned. So take your Bibles with me today and look at Luke chapter 4. And today we're going to read the first 13 verses of Luke chapter 4 as we study the temptation of Jesus. Luke 4, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. If you underline in your Bibles, that's a great phrase to underline. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit, another great verse to underline, we'll talk about it at the end of the service, into the wilderness, when he was tempted by the devil for 40 days, Jesus ate nothing all of that time and became very hungry. Then the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Verse 5, then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory, the devil says, of all of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give away as I please. I will give it all to you if you'll just bow down and worship me. Jesus replied, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off! Jesus, the Scriptures say, He will order the angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with your hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And Jesus responded, The Scriptures also say, You must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him, notice this phrase, until the next opportunity came. Would you pray with me today? Lord, as we look in your word, I pray you'd help us to not only be hearers of your word today, but I pray that you'd help us to be doers of your word. Lord, help us to realize that, that this, this passage, this truth, 
applies to each and every one of us. There's not a person in this auditorium that's exempt from the truth of this passage. Often, Lord, we hear messages and we, uh, we incorrectly think that it's for someone else. I pray you'd help none of us to think that today. Help us all to realize that, that this message is for us. This message is for me. God, help us to learn from our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For the last six weeks, we've been studying the book of Luke. We've been investigating and examining the, the veracity and the authenticity of Jesus Christ. You remember that, that Luke writes this gospel to a man named Theophilus, and, and he writes with the intention of proving to Theophilus that Jesus was who he claimed to be, and that Jesus is worthy of our faith. Jesus is worthy of our trust. Luke begins with the story of Jesus' birth, the Christmas story, and we've seen that the last six weeks, but there's much more to the story of Jesus than Christmas. We spent the last six weeks talking about Christmas and how beautiful it is, but let's not be mesmerized into thinking that Christmas is all there is about Jesus. There's much more than that. So in order for Theophilus and us to be convinced that Jesus is truly the Son of God, Luke shares other stories that demonstrate his power and his deity. The temptation of Jesus is one of those stories. Now, now this story demonstrates two really important truths, and I didn't put this in your notes, but I want you to get this, because, because these are the two things that Luke is demonstrating here. The first is this, the sinlessness of of Jesus Christ. He, he was tempted just like we are, yet he never, ever, ever sinned. Here's a verse, write it down. I didn't put it on the screen. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 said he was tempted in all points like us, yet without sin. Man, we got to believe that because if Jesus sinned, everything else in the remainder of this book is worthless. But he didn't, he overcame sin. But the second thing that this story demonstrates for us is this. We find the source of power for Jesus' followers. How can you overcome temptation? How can Brian overcome temptation? That's the truth that we see in this passage. So, so notice a couple of things with me as we walk through this passage today. The first thing we notice is this. Jesus was tempted in response to his baptism. Now I know what you're thinking. You say, wait a second, Brian, we didn't read anything about his baptism in Luke chapter 4. Are you, are you implying something that's not there? No, follow me. If you've been with us from the very beginning of our study, you'll notice that we studied Luke chapter 1. We spent a lot of time in Luke chapter 2, but we skipped over Luke chapter 3. Now, we didn't skip over it because it's not important or it's not significant for our lives. We skipped over it because it deals with John the Baptist, and we've already talked a lot about John the Baptist. And the latter part of the chapter has this long list of genealogies. And even though genealogies contain a wealth of information, they're not the most interesting topic for us to deal with. And so we kind of jumped over those genealogies, but in the midst of chapter 3 are two verses that I want us to go back and see. Luke chapter 3, verse 21 says this, One day when the crowds were being baptized, John the Baptist was baptizing them. Jesus himself was baptized. As he was praying, the heavens opened. And the Holy Spirit in a bodily form descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved son. You bring me much glory. Now, if you would read the other synoptic gospels, Matthew and Mark, you would realize that Jesus comes to John the Baptist one day and he tells John, hey, hey, John, I want you to baptize me. And, and, and John's response was much like your response or mine would have been, you know, no way, Jose, no way, Jesus. Why, why? I, I'm not going to baptize you. Why, you should baptize me me why am I baptizing you and John says or Jesus says no John listen you don't understand let it be let's do that so that all righteousness will be fulfilled and if you're like me we sit back and ask the question why was Jesus baptized Jesus wasn't a sinner Jesus didn't 
need to be saved. And we know that baptism symbolizes not only what he did for us, but, but the transformation that's occurred in our life. And by the way, let me pause for a second and say that you've never, or if you've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism, that is the very first step in your Christian experience because it demonstrates that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And I would encourage you to do that. But baptism does a couple of things. Baptism, first of all, identifies himself, it identifies Jesus with us. As I mentioned, Jesus was not baptized in recognition of his sinful condition since he was sinless. He was not baptized as a recognition of his need of a Savior because he was the Savior. He was baptized so that he could identify with us and we with him. We always say, you know, I baptize you in the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are baptized. We identify with him and he with us in our baptism. But there's a second thing. In his baptism, Jesus was identified with God the Father. Uh, in that verse, Jesus is baptized, and all of a sudden there's a, there's a booming voice that bellows from heaven. You are my much-loved son, and you bring me a lot of glory. Now, why did God choose that moment to speak from heaven? Because he wanted to identify Jesus Christ as his son. And in doing that, he not only identified Jesus as the Son of God, but he identified Jesus as the Messiah. That's the next thing in your points. In his baptism, Jesus is identified as the Messiah. His baptism was the inauguration of his kingship. It was a declaration that he was the long-awaited Messiah. Jesus' deity was not only confirmed by John the Baptist, but by God the Father. As God bellows out from heaven. What an endorsement. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine no better endorsement? From heaven, God says, this is the one. This is my son. This is the Messiah in whom I am well, am well pleased. You say, okay, Brian, how does that tie in with the temptation? Well, if you look chronologically at Luke, the very next event that takes place is the temptation of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, go back to chapter 4 and verse 1. It begins, in the New Living Translation, it begins with the word then. The word then is a continuation word. It's a, it's a tying word. And the idea is this, that when Jesus rose from those baptismal waters, that immediately after his baptism, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. You say, Brian, what, what, it, what is taking place? Well, that was no mere coincidence. Immediately after he was inaugurated by God as the king, immediately after he was recognized by God the Father as God's son, he was tempted. And it wasn't just any temptation. This was battle. This was war. This was, this was God's enemy trying to thwart the plans of God. So it's important for us to understand contextually that Jesus' Jesus temptation was in response to his baptism. Let me pause for a second and apply that to you and me because anytime you make a decision to do something for God whether you give your life to Christ at the moment of salvation or whether you make a commitment that you're going to do this, you're not going to do this, you're going to have a marriage that honors God, you're going to have a communication and conversation that honors God, and you make a commitment to do something for God, look out, because the enemy doesn't like it. And the enemy will attack it. That's what we find with Jesus Christ. His temptation was in response to his baptism. Notice the second thing that I wrote. The second thing is this. Jesus was tempted in response to his weaknesses. And I know what you're thinking. I put the word weaknesses in quotes there because Jesus doesn't have any weaknesses. Can I get an amen? There ought to be an amen there. Jesus doesn't have 
any weaknesses. He was God in the flesh. He was perfect. He was Almighty God. He was the all-powerful one. Yet as the enemy observed him, the enemy attacked him in the areas that seemed to be his weakness. And we see that in the passage. You say, okay, Brian, how then did Satan attack him? Notice in the passage, first of all, Satan attacked Jesus' appetites. In verse 2, we've already read it. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and in verse 1, verse 2, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. You see, here's what I want you to catch. The the desire for bread that Jesus was experiencing there in the wilderness was real. Why was it real? Because Jesus had not eaten for 40 days. Sometimes we read that and we kind of brush over it because we're like, he's God. God wanted to. God could go 365 days without eating. What's the big deal? But it's important for us to realize that not only was Jesus God, but Jesus was fully man. And being fully man, a complete man, he experienced the same physical sensations that you and I go through. Fatigue, thirst, hunger. He experienced all of that. Mark eleven twelve 12 says the next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. So here in Luke chapter 4, after having spent 40 days in the Judean wilderness, having not eaten anything, The text says very simply, Jesus was hungry. I don't know how hunger affects you, and I'd venture to say most of us haven't gone 40 days without eating. I generally go four hours without eating, all right, if you're like me, but a lack of eating produces hunger. Hunger produces weakness, physical weakness, mental weakness, spiritual weakness. I don't know how it affects you, but when I'm hungry, I kind of have a bad attitude. Does anybody else do that? Every once in a while, I have a bad attitude, and Vicki will look at me, and she'll say, would you just go get something to eat, please? All right, that's, that's why I look this way. I, I end up eating all the time in response to that. What? A, a, a lack of food has a way of affecting us. That's what was taking place with Jesus. It was at the moment of Jesus' physical weakness when he hadn't eaten for 40 days that the devil comes to him and he tempts him. And he tempts him with what? He tempts him with what he desired most at that moment. I I sent a, a tweet out this week on Twitter and I simply said this, we are most vulnerable to temptation when we are weak when we are tired or even hungry. When you're going through moments of weakness, look out. Your enemy knows it. You're vulnerable, and he will attack your point of weakness. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 26, 41. Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Remember how we said this morning, you're weak Your flesh is weak. My flesh is weak. we got to look out at those moments. You see, with Jesus, the desire for bread was real. He was was starving. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. But, But I want you to see something else in the passage because I believe that desire for bread was not only real, but the desire for bread was also symbolic because it represented God given desires that can be sinfully fulfilled. Let me pause for a second and say this. God's the one who gave us our appetites. You might sit back and say, man, who's the one that came up with this hunger thing anyways? That was God's idea. God's the one that gave us our appetites, whether it's thirst, whether it's hunger, whether it's even our sexual desires. God is the one who gave us those desires. Those are God-given desires. And having those desires is not a sin unless we give in to them in a sinful way. Each of those desires can be fulfilled righteously righteously. 
But each of those desires can be fulfilled sinfully as well. You see here in the passage, it wasn't a sin for Jesus to eat bread. It wasn't a sin. It was like... It wasn't like, you know, Satan was, was dangling something sinful in front of Jesus. Jesus, here's a beautiful woman. Come on, you can have her. Come on. He was giving him what? Bread. All of us at some time today, sometime today are probably going to eat bread. It wasn't the bread that was a sin. It was giving in to that temptation fulfilling that temptation in a way that did not please God, that made it a sin. And so whenever you and I give in to temptations like that, we overeat and we indulge and, and then we throw up and we have an eating disorder, that's when God is not pleased. When we have sexual relations outside of marriage, that's when God is not pleased. Whenever we fulfill those temptations outside of the way in which God intended for those temptations to be fulfilled. And what was taking place with Jesus here, the temptation was not just that he eat bread, was that he fulfilled that temptation in a way that God did not plan for him. You see, man's desires must be righteously satisfied. Although starving, Jesus didn't bite at the bait. He simply reminded Satan that man should not live by bread alone. By the way, if you want to write down this passage, Deuteronomy chapter 8 is where Jesus gets that from. And that's a, that's a great context to go back and read that entire context. Satan attacked Jesus' appetites. Secondly, Satan attacked Jesus' authority. The second temptation is found in, in verses 5 through 7. And I want you to see that once again. Notice verse 5. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and the authority over them, the devil said, because they're mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it to you if you will just bow down and worship me. As God's own proclaimed king of kings, Jesus had a divine right to all God's kingdoms. And it was that right to which Satan appealed the second temptation. Here's what the devil's telling Jesus. I'll put it in my own words. He's saying, hey, why should you have to wait for that which is rightfully yours? Yeah, okay, I get it. Satan understands the Bible. One day you're going to be crowned king of kings and lord of lords. But why wait? Why would you wait and go through all of that when you can experience that right now? Jesus, you deserve it now. Why do you submit as a servant when you could reign as king? Bow down and worship me, and I will give you all that is rightfully yours. Sounds like a legitimate request. Jesus could have sat back and said, you're right. <laughs> I do deserve to reign. Why? Let me get it quicker, sooner rather than later. That was extremely dangerous. It was dangerous for two reasons. This attack undermined the worship of Jesus because Jesus comes back and once again he uses Deuteronomy chapter 6 and he says this, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. But this attack also undermined the mission of Jesus. Think with me. If at that moment Jesus would have said, wow, sounds good to me, bow down and worship the devil, the kingdom would have been his he would have bypassed the cross. He would have never paid the price for our sins. And the devil knew that. The temptation undermined not only the adoration, the worship of Jesus, but it undermined the mission of Jesus as well. I noticed something as I was reading this this week. I noticed this. Notice that verse once again. Let me find that in verse 8 it says, You must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Worship and service go hand in hand. You worship what you serve, and you serve what you worship. Let me say that again. Worship and service go hand in hand. You worship what you serve, and you serve what you worship. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? 
oftentimes we're not serving the Lord because we worship other things. Other things are too, man, Brian, if I had time, I would be involved, man, I'd be there. I mean, we asked for four people to be involved in Hope House. If I had time, I'd do that. I'd do that. I just don't, I don't have time. Why? Because our lives are so wrapped up in other things that God is not the focus, the focal point of. Now, I'm not saying in order to worship the Lord, you got to work at Hope House, you got to do something like this, but what I am saying is this, your worship of God will drive you to service, and your service, in turn, will lead you to worship. If you're not serving, I'd ask myself the question, what am I worshiping? Because worship leads to service. Notice the second thing, or the third thing, Satan attacked Jesus' acceptance. In, in verse 9, he, he simply says this, a phrase that, that stuck out to me. He said, if you are the Son of God, jump off. He takes him to the highest place in the temple there in Jerusalem, and he's overlooking the temple and then the courtyard and all the people that are worshiping. And, and Satan looks at Jesus and he said, hey man, you, you know what? You could jump from here. As a matter of fact, Jesus, let me quote to you. And Satan takes Psalm 91 and he preaches a message to Jesus. He takes Psalm 91, which is a messianic psalm that promises that God will protect his Messiah, and say, man, you know, you know what? You're invincible. You got nothing to lose. Why, if you jump from here, God has promised to send his angels to come and rescue you. Why? Not even a foot of yours is going to be hurt. What a better way to prove your Messiahship. See all those people down there? How cool would it be, Jesus, if you jumped off the temple and all of a sudden, here come these angels. They come in and they swoop down and they protect you. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be a great way to prove that you are who you claim to be? And by the way, you're God's son. Well, that would be a great way for God to demonstrate the fact that he loves you. I wrote two things in my notes. Satan proposed that giving into this temptation would have proved Jesus' sonship. And he proposed that giving into this temptation would have proved Jesus' messiahship. Man, Jesus, this is a good idea. If you do this, everybody's going to know that you are who you are claim to be let me pause there for a second and say something that's really important satan knows the word of god and satan has a way of manipulating the word of god to make that which is wrong seem right did you see that in the passage be careful church just because someone says that the Bible means something doesn't mean that's what it actually means. Did you get that? I use the word mean over and over again. Just because somebody uses the Bible to prove a point doesn't mean that's what the Bible is saying. And it doesn't mean that's what God wants you to do. You sit back and say, well, man, Brian, that's confusing. How do we know the difference? Here's a couple of rules for biblical interpretation I put in your notes. First of all, the Bible must be interpreted historically. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Each book was written for a purpose. And for us to take a phrase outside, the second thing is the Bible must be interpreted contextually. To take a phrase out of its context demonstrates that I can give it any meaning that I want. You see, today, I could take verses of Scripture, man, and I could convince you that you need to leave your wives I wouldn't interpret the Bible correctly, but I could take verses and try to prove that. Why? I could take verses and convince you that I am the leader and you need to drink some Kool-Aid and follow me. Say, Brian, would somebody do that? Has somebody done that? The Bible must be interpreted contextually. And the Bible must be interpreted literally as well. As a pastor, it just drives me crazy. I'm going to admit it, and don't ask my opinion on some of these things, I'll tell you, all right? 
But it drives me crazy when I watch TV preachers take the Word of God and manipulate the Word of God and make it mean something that it doesn't mean. That's what the devil was doing. Hey, Jesus, you know Psalm 91? Psalm 91 says that God has promised to protect you. And if you jump, he'll take care of you. Jump! The Bible tells you to jump. It'll demonstrate your messiahship. And he used the Bible to try to convince Jesus to do that. Notice how Jesus responds. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. You see, as we study this, we see how Jesus, and by the way, this wasn't the only time that Jesus was tempted. Sometimes we get the idea that Jesus only went through that 40 days of temptation and that was it. No, Jesus was tempted at every stage in his life, every way that you and I are tempted. As a boy, he was tempted. As an adolescent, he was tempted. As a teenager, a pubescent teenager, he was tempted. As a man, he was tempted. He was tempted in every way that you and I can possibly be tempted, yet without sin. Satan went after his appetites, went after his authority, and he went after his acceptance. What does he go after in your life? There, there's a last thing that we see in the passage that I want to show you before we go. The last thing that we see in the passage is this. Jesus was victorious, and he was victorious as a result of two responses. And I want you to see these responses. Bear with me this morning. These are, th th this is important today. The first thing is this. Here's why Jesus was victorious over temptation. Because he was controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. He was controlled by the Holy Spirit. Go back to verse 1. I told you to underline this in the very beginning. Verse 1, it says this. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan River and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Two times in the first verse, we find that Jesus was led by and controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. You say, Brian, what does that mean? I wrote down several things in your notes. The first is this, and this is an important theological point. Jesus laid aside his divine powers and overcame temptation by the power of of the Holy Spirit. I want to take just a moment and explain that because you and I read these temptations and we sit back and think, that had to be so easy for Jesus because Jesus is God. <laughs> and James chapter 1 says that God can't be tempted with evil. And so it's easy for us to think, okay, it says he was tempted, but he really wasn't tempted. Listen, these temptations were real. Uh, Jesus laid aside his divine powers and he overcame these temptations by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Here's a great verse, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Let me get it, Philippians 2, 6 and 7. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Yeah, he overcame temptation, and he overcame it just as you and I overcome it. So the next thing I wrote down is this, like Jesus, we overcome temptation by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Hey, hey here's the bottom line. You know why Brian gives in to temptation? Because I'm not controlled by the Holy Spirit. Do you know why you give in to temptation? Because you're not being controlled by the Holy Spirit. We want to be in control. We want to make decisions. We want to do things our way. And we blow it over and over and over again. Paul said it this way in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. He said, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. Be filled by the Holy Spirit. Let me take just a second and explain that because that's really important. Being filled with the Holy Spirit does not refer to us having more of Him. The moment you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you received all of the Holy Spirit's 
Man, read the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul was speaking to a carnal church, and he told them, he said, we all have the exact same indwelling spirits. The idea is not, okay, God, in order for me to be victorious, you've got to give me more of you. No, being filled with the Spirit is not having more of God, but of God having more of you. It's an issue of surrender. You see, if it's an idea of God having more of us, we can kind of throw the blame off on God. If you would only give me more power, then I could overcome this temptation. It's not God's fault. God's given us everything we need. The problem is ours because we don't submit to the control of the Holy Spirit. Jesus did. He was filled with the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. And as a result, he overcame temptation. Let me give you a last thing. Not only was he controlled by the Spirit, but he was protected by the Word of God. You notice all three times, his response was the same. The Scriptures say the scriptures say the scriptures say when i was a when i was a little boy my mom used to give me all these phrases and she would and she would she actually every time she gave me a bible she would write this in my bible she would say brian this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book and and quite frankly church can i can i be lovingly pastoral right now You know why you struggle with sin? Because you're not spending time in the Word of God. If you spend time in the Word of God, this, and you allow the Holy Spirit of God to take the truth of the Word of God, it will change you. But if you don't spend time in the Word, then you allow the actions and attitudes and activities of life to keep you from the book. And you have an enemy that wants to do everything he can to keep you from the word of God. Man, he'll make sure you're too busy. He'll make sure your favorite TV show comes on the only time that you have available. He'll make sure that you get a phone call right when you're starting to read the Bible. He'll make sure that you'll start to read it and not understand it. He'll give you every excuse in the book. If he can keep you from the book... He can keep sin controlling your life. But Jesus was victorious because he allowed the Holy Spirit of God to control him. And he allowed the word of God to protect him. David said in Psalm 119, your word have I hid in my heart, God, so that I will not sin against you. In 2014, if you want to be victorious, here's the key. Be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. We used to sing this song. To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. My desire to be like him. You see, you'll never overcome temptation in your life until you, until you have a burning desire to be like Jesus and you realize you can't do it on your own you become poor in spirit and you realize that you need God and that realization drives you to his word and it causes you to surrender to him and when you do we can be victorious and Jesus was tempted he was tried and he was victorious You're going to be tempted today. More than likely when you get in your car to leave, you're going to be tempted. You're going to be tried. The question is, will you be victorious?